Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Isle. This is episode, I think, 65 of Left Side of the Isle. It's for the week of uh, July 11th through 18th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention worthy of your attention. Um, as always, any reactions to the show of any sort, good or bad, or tips, comments, suggestions, ideas, whatever, can be sent to me. In fact, should be sent to me directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And uh, I never expect you actually to have caught that on the fly, so you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be displayed over here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And um, you can get the email address in there. I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, as I freely admit. But I do answer it. I do, however, very strongly request that uh, in the subject line, you include something like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that, so that I know it's not spam. All right, slightly, uh, not slightly, a rather different look for left side of the aisle this week. A little bit of an experiment to see how this works out. Uh, hopefully it will. Uh, but uh, I'm going to start actually today by talking about something that uh, what's well, actually rather big, important news. It really is big, important news, which you may not have heard much about. Um, and even if you did hear about it, it probably wasn't explained to you correctly. The thing is, this news is just starting to penetrate the mass media in the United States. Now, places like The New York Times and other major newspapers have carried some information about it. But uh, the broadcast media, very little, unless you're watching shows specifically about business or something like that. Uh, even though this is big news most everywhere else in the world, but as often happens, what's big news everywhere else isn't important here because we're more interested in Kate Moss or whoever than we are in the news of the world. All right, but this is about something called LIBOR. LIBOR, L-I-B-O-R. It stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate. Each day, a consortium of 18 major international banks um, submit to the British Bankers Association. This is, this is a trade group. They submit an, uh, an estimate of the interest rates at which they think their bank could borrow money on a short-term loan from other major banks. The association throws out the four highest and the four lowest estimates and averages the other 10 to come up with the daily LIBOR rate. In other words, LIBOR is a measure of the interest rates that banks charge each other for short-term borrowing, uh, loans made without any guarantee against default. So they're supposed to reflect the actual market cost, the actual risk involved in these loans. Now, this figure is monitored by government agencies, including such as the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and the uh, Financial Services Authority in the United Kingdom, but it's not regulated by anybody. Now, the question, why is LIBOR important? Well, uh, because it provides the baseline on which many, many other loans are based, on which the interest for many other loans and transactions is based. It directly affects around $10 trillion in loans, and it's estimated by the Wall Street Journal, in fact, that it indirectly affects $800 trillion in financial transactions around the world. Uh, it sets the interest rates from everything from derivatives of multiple sorts right down to things like the interest on your savings account or the interest rate on a student loan or a business loan or a variable rate mortgage. All of these kind of loans often are pegged to LIBOR in the same way other things are pegged to the U.S. prime rate. For example, your credit card. If you have a variable rate credit card, you'll probably notice that it says the rate is based on the U.S. prime rate. All of these loans, $800 trillion worth, are based on LIBOR. So this is a big deal. This is an important number. In fact, the um, internationally respected business magazine, The Economist, calls it the most important figure in finance. And evidence is growing, evidence is emerging, that it has been manipulated for years by the banks for the benefit of, guess who, the banks. So far, the scandal has been limited to Barclays, which is a, an old, uh, actually about 300 years old, a very old and a very big bank based in London. 
Barclays just paid $453 million in, finance, uh, in fines rather, to U.S. and British uh, bank regulators. Barclays' top executives, their three top, its three top executives have been forced to resign. Uh, and in fact, the emails of its traders, which came out as part of this settlement, give what uh, former Labor Secretary Robert Rice called a chilling picture of how easily Barclays people got their, got their colleagues their, uh, to, to rig, or at very least try to rig, the figures in order to make big bucks. And because of the daily flow and flux of like derivatives trading, even small changes in the interest rate can make a huge difference. In fact, in um, 2007, it was estimated that the gain for Barclays Bank alone, that the gain or loss it stood to have on a single day of um, derivatives trading based on normal fluctuation of interest rates could be $40 million a day. But here's the thing, this is where this scandal starts to grow real claws. Because of the way it's calculated, remember it's 18 figures, you throw out eight of them and average the middle 10. There is no way that Barclays on its own could have manipulated LIBOR enough to actually make a difference. It was only through the, co the, through the collusion of the other banks, or at least a significant number of them, that this would even be possible. Uh, and the thing is, Wall Street banks, the usual suspects like J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, they're right in there with this group. In fact, over the past week, rather damning evidence has emerged. These emerge in the documents, again, the detail, the settlement that Barclays made with the regulators. These documents show that employees at Barclays and at several other unnamed banks tried to rig the LIBOR number repeatedly over a period of at least five years. In other words, they were rigging the international system of finance for their own short-term gain and selfish needs. Gee, what a shock. Uh, quoting Robert Reich again, this is insider trading on a gigantic scale. It makes the bankers winners and the rest of us, whose money they've used to make their bets, losers and chumps. And if that wasn't enough, there is a second uh, a related scandal. Around 2007, when the whole rotten structure of derivatives of derivatives of derivatives was starting to teeter like a two-foot stack of pennies, Barclays was submitting figures to the, for, for LIBOR clearly below what they should have been. That is, remember, these, these rates are supposed to be what you think it would cost you to borrow money from other banks. And maybe the banks would have charged Barclays this much, but Barclays was saying they're only going to charge us this much. What this does is it makes Barclays look like a less risky loan partner, as less likely to default on those loans, and which means a better financial health than it actually was. Barclays was actively concealing its own increasingly precarious financial condition. Now, in its own defense, bank officials say they did this because all the other banks were doing the same thing. And Barclays could not afford to be an outlier. So all these banks were actually concealing their actual financial positions. Those banks did not prevent the collapse of the financial system. But they did accomplish two things. One, they protected their bottom line in the short term. And two, they made sure when the collapse did come in 2008 that it was even worse than it would have been. There are now investigations about all this going on in several countries, including Canada, America, Japan, the European Union, Switzerland, and Britain. Uh, the chief executive of one multinational bank referred to this as the banking industry's tobacco moment. He was referring to that uh, back in 1998 when things really hit the fan for the uh, tobacco industry and they wound up being hit with $200 billion in, in court settlements. Now this has led to some people defending the banks and not just on the, um, the usual kind of dismissive tone, the, the number two at the Bank of England referred to this. This is, a, this is just a minor scandal and was harumphing about how that's all in the past and things are all better now. Don't worry about it anymore. Um, but no, even beyond that, there are people defending the banks on the jaw-dropping argument that, 
Quoting one, the world cannot afford endless litigation against banks. It's too much of a threat to growth, too much of a threat to the world economy, too much of a threat to anything and everything that we hold dear. We just cannot afford, we're being told, to hold the banks responsible for their actions, their criminal actions. Just like in 2008, just like multiple times before, we're just supposed to suck it up, uh, just count up our losses, lick our wounds, and, and accept that the prospect of doing anything beyond that is just too terrible to contemplate. It's too big to fail all over again, except now it's even beyond too big to fail to too big to even dare to challenge. But frankly, as always, too big to fail should mean too big to exist. That's the risk we can't face. Frankly, it's not only time to, to break up the banks, it's past time to break up the banks. In fact, it's time to take over the banks. These banks starting to fail, don't bail them out. Take them over, not just to resell them to some supposedly more efficient uh, group of investors, but to turn them into public, non-profit banks and credit unions. And if the banks and bankers don't like that, well, tough. They've been stepping on our face long enough, and it's about time that they got a look at what the soles of our shoes look like up close. Now, there's a couple of quick footnotes about this. One, Bob Diamond, he was uh, the CEO of Barclays. He's one of the people who was forced out. He seems shocked that this happened. He's an American by birth, and he apparently expected to be subject to what New York Times reporter Gretchen Morgenstern called um, the American rules of engagement. This is where CEOs, when faced with, uh, with evidence of the illegal dealings of their corporations, they, they sacrifice a few mid-level managers, maybe give up a bonus or two, and then just ride out the storm. And regulators, if they act at all, act to impose fines, which can really come out of the pocket of the shareholders. And there's never criminal punishment for the people who really committed the crimes. Well, in this case, the regulators in the United Kingdom now, they may have been asleep at the wheel. But once they woke up, they are pursuing criminal investigations and appear more interested in actually doing their job than regulators here are. Um, the other footnote also involved, involved Diamond, by the way. Um, in its settlement with regulators, Barclays admitted that its traders had manipulated the LIBOR rate on hundreds of occasions. Well, Diamond retorted in a memo to staff, quoting him, on the majority of days, no requests were made at all. Which, as somebody pointed out, was rather like a, an adulterer saying that on most days he didn't cheat on his wife. All right, I'm going to leave that aside for now. I'm going to move on to something else. I'm going to move on to what has become a regular feature of the show, um, the Clarabelle Award. The Clarabelle Award, given for meritorious stupidity. Uh, the dishonoree this week is one Chris Collins. He's the Gopper candidate for Congress in the 27th District of New York State. In a recent interview with an online site called The Batavian, he explained, if I can abuse the word in that way, he explained why he is against the Health Care Act, or so-called Obamacare. You see, he said, the reason health care is so expensive these days has nothing to do with the health insurance industry. It's got nothing to do with the obscene profits of the pharmaceutical industry or, uh, or any, anything else. It, it, what it actually has to do with, he said, quote, people now don't die from prostate cancer, breast cancer, and some of the other things, unquote. Well, in fact, an estimated 577,000 people will die of cancer in the U.S. this year, including about 40,000 from breast cancer and 28,000 from prostate cancer. Now, those figures come from the American Cancer Society, which also notes that uh, uninsured people who have less access to regular health care, um, those people are less likely to have their cancer detected in their early stages, which, of course, makes the cancer much more expensive to treat. Now, when Collins' Democratic opponent, the incumbent Kathleen Hochul is her name, when she pointed out those facts, Collins responded like the clown he is. He accused her of, this is a quote, politicizing cancer. 
It's sort of a variation on my rule number 12 for right-wing debate. I've talked about these rules before. Maybe I should do them again sometime. But uh, rule number 12 noted how often right-wingers call for violence. And then when violence actually occurs, if you point to their words, they'll accuse you of politicizing a tragedy. The rule is never, never, never admit any uh, responsibility for the meaning or impact of your own words. And here we've got Collins just refusing to admit the meaning of his own words. In fact, his statement was so thoroughly dumb that the editor of the Batavian took it upon himself to say on Collins' behalf that Collins obviously meant that fewer people die of breast and prostate cancer, not that no one does. Except, Collins had the opportunity to say exactly that in his response to Hochul. He could have said, don't be silly, obviously, it was a little hyperbole, obviously, I don't think that no one dies of this. But he didn't say that, even though he had the perfect opportunity to. So did he really mean fewer rather than none? And if that wasn't enough, he went on to say, quoting today, our healthcare today is so much better. We're living so much longer because of innovations in drug development, surgical procedures, and, and other technological developments. This actually is flat out wrong. Life expectancy as we normally express it refers to life expectancy at birth. The vast majority of the increase in life expectancy that we have seen over the past several decades has been in reduction in infant and youth mortality. It's not that people are living to a greater age, it's that fewer people are dying young. Um, and if that's not clear, think of, think of it this way. Pick an age, say 80, okay? It's not that more people are living beyond 80, it's that more people are living to 80. Um, now, the, the things he cites, these technological developments that he cites, have enabled us to live healthier to a greater age, but it has not really extended the age to which most people live. So, Collins is indifferent to the needs of the poor, he's either unable to admit or too dumb to recognize a boner, um, and he's ignorant to boot, a triple threat, and a real clown. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute. Here we are, back again. That didn't take long, did it? Uh, all right, now we're going to go back now to our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Um, this outrage refers to the fact that the Pentagon is creating or talking about creating a new medal. It would be called the Distinguished Warfare Medal. Now, this hasn't been approved yet, but the Army Institute of Heraldry, which is the outfit that actually designs uh, military decorations, it's already submitted six alternate designs. All right, so what's the outrage about the medal? Uh, not about the medal, it's about what it's for. These medals are specifically designed, specifically intended to be awarded to those people who pilot predator drones to attack targets in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. That is, they are medals to be given to pilots who sit in bases literally thousands of miles from the conflicts, thousands of miles from any possibility of injury beyond a cramped hand or a severely calloused thumb, thousands of miles away from the death and destruction their actions cause, which appear to them only as grainy video on a computer screen. And now to, they're to be rewarded for, for what? Their bravery? Apparently so, yes. Writing in the May-June issue of the Air, uh, it's called the Air and Space Power Journal, an Air Force major named Dave Blair uh, wrote about, he wondered aloud about how much difference there is between danger at 10,000 feet and at 10,000 miles. See, according to him, an aircraft with an actual, an actual aircraft with an actual pilot in it, that merely scrapes the top of a combat zone, uh, which is well outside the range of any realistic threat, he says, that such a pilot is considered to be in combat because it was actually in a combat zone. But a Predator drone firing a missile is mere combat support. And apparent to him, this just doesn't seem fair. It's just not fair that the drone pilots, these joystick jockeys, it's not fair that these drone pilots sitting at computer screens, killing people by remote control, are not regarded as being in actual combat, as being right there in the thick of things, right there in the front lines with the grunts and the foxholes. 
Now, years ago, in fact, it was a few decades ago now, the military started talking about the electronic battlefield. In fact, the, 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 the center of the Army's command for the Electronics Warfare Command, it was called, was actually at a military base just down the road from where I was living. Some people started worrying about wars of robots, and other people started worrying about how increasingly isolating people from the actual effects of what they are doing desensitizes people to those effects and so makes them easier to do, that this is all making wars easy. Um, it's taken some time, but we are surely there. We are surely at that point. Those who kill computer images by, at a distance of thousands of miles, they're to regard it now as engaging in work that is not even just deemed as necessary, but as positively courageous worthy of medals. As Glenn Greenwald said, quoting him, if the mere act of taking steps that will result in the deaths of others makes one brave, consider all the killers who now merit that term. Dictators who order protesters executed, tyrants who send others off to war, prison guards who activate electric chairs. Consider too, that when one of these drones actually does succeed in killing somebody, it's referred to, this is the actual military term for that, it's referred to as a bug splat. Human beings referred to as bugs to be squashed. And the people who do the squashing in complete safety from thousands of miles away to be rewarded for their bravery. A week, frankly, does not seem long enough to me for that level of outrage. But it's what I've got. It's the outrage of the week. All right, after that, I have to lighten things up for the end. So we are going to go to another of our occasional features. It's called And Another Thing. And this is where we talk about things that aren't really political. They're usually cool science stuff. Sometimes they're fun things or silly things, but usually it's some cool science stuff. And this week, we do have some cool science stuff. Now, this, again, is something that's, it has been all over the news. I'm sure you've heard about it, uh, even if you didn't understand it, which wouldn't be surprising if you didn't understand it, because the very likelihood is that the people explaining it to you didn't understand it either. On July 4th, two teams at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is known by the, by the acronym of its French name, CERN, C-E-R-N, these two teams announced that after years of smashing together subatomic particles at uh, nearly the speed of light, they had found a new elementary particle, which, in the cautious words of scientists, is consistent with the characteristics predicted for the Higgs boson. Put another way, they had all but certainly found what has become known as the God particle. Uh, because of the way it cements the standard model of, uh, of physics, of subatomic physics. Simply put, very simply put, even overly simply put, there are two types of subatomic particles, fermions and bosons. Now, fermions are usually associated with matter, while bosons are the force carriers between particles. They transmit forces. Uh, for, for one example, an electron is a fermion, um, while a photon, which can be thought of as a particle of light, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a boson. All right, here is the issue. Here is the issue. Scientists had this nice, it's, it's rather complicated, but it's still, it's still organized. They had this organized pattern of relationships among various families of subatomic particles. There's a whole zoo of subatomic particles, but they can be grouped into families based on similar characteristics. Um, and they had uh, scientists develop this, you know, this pattern of relationships among these families and among the individual particles that made up the families. Each particle has its own characteristics. But scientists, always looking for the next question, still had a question. Why? Why did these particles have these characteristics? Um, and here's, here's one that, that's, that's relevant right here. Fermions, for example, these are the, like the matter particles, like electrons. Fermions are essentially point 
particles. They essentially have zero volume. So why do they, and in fact, how can they have mass? And how can the masses of all of these, of all of these zero volume subatomic particles be different from each other? Where does mass come from? The Higgs boson was the hypothetical answer to that question. The Higgs boson, which was named for Peter Higgs, he was a British physicist who actually came up with the idea and made the prediction of the particle. The Higgs boson would make up the Higgs field, which permeates all of space. Um, it's been described in various things as being like a molasses or, or, or a liquid or something, which is a terrible description. It's an absolutely terrible description. A better way to think of it would be like being in a room and there's light in the room. Well, anywhere you look in that room, there's light. Uh, so light is like permeating that room. And think of it that way. Think of it that way. The Higgs field permeates all of space. The thing is, different particles would interact differently with the Higgs field, some of them more strongly than others. Well, so the more strongly a particle interacts with the Higgs field, the more energy it would take to move the particle through that field. And since the amount of energy it takes to move something to overcome its inertia is a definition of mass, the Higgs field would be why things have mass because different particles interact with the Higgs field. And it would also then explain why different things have different masses. That hypothesis specified, the one that Peter Higgs came up with, specified the characteristics of the Hig that the Higgs boson would have to have in order to fit the idea that he was proposing. And it is a particle with those characteristics that research at CERN have now found. Now, by the way, I'm gonna, just to give you an idea of what they do, I'm going to bring up a picture here. This picture you see here is of, uh, it was released by CERN. It's a picture of the results of one of their experiments in their, uh, in their it's called the Large Hadron Collider. It's where they do these experiments. And this is the kind of thing that they analyze in looking for the Higgs boson. So, um, years ago, Bill Cosby, back when he was funny instead of uh, an obnoxious old man screaming, get off my lawn. Uh, he had a comedy album called Why Is There Air? And this way, this is like that. It's one of those fundamental why questions. Questions that we so basic that sometimes we don't even think to ask them. Why is there mass? Now scientists think they know the answer to that basic question. And how cool is that? All right, that's it for me for the week. I got about half a minute left, I think. So uh, I'm just going to say my farewells. Thank you. Let us know what you think of the new look of, uh, of the show here. And we're just trying it out, see what it looks like. But you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week.